Howdy, our presentation today will be about George Telemann. So, whose man's was Telemann, <laughs> really? So, George Philip Telemann was born on March 14th in 1681 in Magdeburg, and he died on June 25th, 1767 in Hamburg. And so he was mostly self-taught. He taught himself a lot of instruments, including the recorder, the violin, and the zither. Um, and he taught himself theory by analyzing music of other composers. And this was because his parents just did not like him learning music at all. So they didn't allow him to have anyone to teach him. So he just taught himself. And he was really good at it because by age 12, he wrote his own opera. Wow. And so, like I said, he was banned from music by his parents, so they confiscated all of his instruments that he'd taught himself, and so he had to sneak out, and he had to practice on other people's instruments. And because they found this out, and they were like, hey, stop doing that, and so they sent him to study mathematics and general education with Kaspar Kalover, and Kalover taught him the, about the relationship between math and music because he was deep into that and so Telemann supplemented this education about music theory by um, um, self-teaching himself thorough bass which is another word for basso continuo and then he became a scholar at the gymnasium Andreanum in Hildesheim and gymnasium is just a fancy word for school because it meant something different back then, and he was actually commissioned by the rector to write music for the Latin school dramas, as well as by um, the uh, local priest, Father Crispin, who asked him to play for the local Catholic churches, even though he wasn't there to study music. After he graduated, he went to Leipzig to study law, but even though he was going to study law, he still got pulled into um, composing music for people because he tried to hide it, but it didn't really work And so he was commissioned by the mayor himself to write music for the city's two churches And so he gave in he was like all right I guess music's just my life now and he became the music director at the Opera House um, Auf dem Pool in 1702 and then at um, Newkirk, I can't pronounce German words and while in Newkirk uh, he had a rivalry with Johann Kunau, which, um, who was the Thomas Cantor of Leipzig, which is the uh, fancy word for uh, the city music director. And during this rivalry, um, they like had fights over like resources, like um, venues, and like people in the choirs and stuff. And it got to the point where like he actually was banned from opera, like banned from opera by wow. Kunau. And he How briefly dramatic. Met, he, <laughs> briefly, uh, he briefly met Handel, and then he worked for some aristocracy, which I'm not gonna try and pronounce these names, so have fun with that. And then he worked as the city music director and Kappelmeister in Frankfurt. And the peak of his career is when he became cantor of the Johannium Leitenschul, and the music director of Hamburg's five main churches. And while there, he did a lot of stuff. He wrote two cantatas per Sunday, one Passion for Lent a year, one Capitan's music per year, music for induction ceremonies, civic ceremonies, and consecrations, and he directed um, the Collegium Musicum, which put on public concerts like every week and then later twice a week. He taught music theory, singing, and music history classes for boys, and he also was the head of the local opera house. And one thing that I found that was really important about him is he actually got royalties for his music, which was interesting because like back then, like everyone was just kind of borrowing from everyone else. And he was like, I want to print my music. But the city music printer was like, you can't do that. I have the rights to print music. And so they took it to court, and the city music printer got to print his music, but he actually got royalties and some free copies for it. So I thought that was pretty interesting. That's it, sorry. I took a lot. Part okay. two. Okay, so um, as far as his music, compositionally, Telemann produced a huge amount of music. Um, 
He was doing several cantatas every Sunday, lots of passions. He actually wrote many more passions than like Bach ever did. Um, and then he was still doing things like um, concertos and things along that line, those lines. That's how the thing works. Um, stylistically, he was very pro um, programmatic, programmatic <laughs> when he uh, composed pieces. So he liked everything to have a bit of a story behind it. And that really helped, um, he felt, with conveying things to um, his audience. And it made it so that they wanted to hear a little bit more of his music. Um, in like an autobiography, um, he had written, what I have accomplished with respect to musical style is well known. First came the Polish style, followed by the French church, chamber, and operatic styles. And finally, the Italian style, which currently occupies me much more than the others do. And when he says that, he's basically referring to um, a period in time where he'd actually helped develop like this style of music called like mixed German. Um, and that was a combination of um, French, Polish, and Italian, and then he moved on to um, more of the this Italian style that had a lot of um, like triplets and things along the lines of like what we would now call like Scottish snaps and things like that. So one of his bigger pieces was Hamburger Eb and Luth ish. Um, it's also known as either Washer Music, Washer Music or just water music if you're down for the English version. Um, it was composed in 1723 for a celebration in the city of Hamburger. Hamburg? Hamburg. Um, and it was basically because the city itself was like on a port, it celebrated um, seafaring life and naval defense. Um, the suite was written in C major and composed for two oboes, basso continuo, violin, viola, and violine, which is basically like the equivalent of what we would see in like a double bass today. So it's almost like another basso continuo instrument. Um, so it's an orchestral suite with 10 movements total, and all of them had a bit of a story behind them. So you had the overture, which is like a grave passage at the beginning, followed by a lighter fugue. Then it goes on to a cerebon, which represents the sleeping nymph um, Thetis, the beret, which is Thetis awakening, uh, the lure, which is Neptune in love, gavotte, which is Naiad's play, the harlequinade, which is the jesting triton, um, der stubmen alis, which is the turbulent alis, the minuet, which is about the amicable um, zephyr, the jig, gig ish, which is ebb and flow, and then the canary, which is the merry sailors, which that one sort of connects directly back to the event. And when um, he actually composed this, people were like really pumped up about it, like they thought it was awesome and that it was really, really fitting for the situation. Um, and what had actually happened was years before then, he was commissioned by King George the First to compose. Um, this orchestral suite that was actually like it was performed on somebody's boat by a very similar group of instruments so it's really possible that he could have been borrowing from himself for this situation mm -hmm. um so one of the movements the harlequinade which is der skirchten triton or like the jesting triton basically um is this is just what we're going to look at so it's a harlequinade in general is meant to be something that is um, more or less like the orchestral version of like opera buffa. It's very like light, it's upbeat, it's meant to be fun. Um, so just looking at like, this is just the first, yeah, the first portion of it. Um, it's very upbeat, there's a lot of upward motion and it's very, very homorhythmic. So you can almost hear like, it's as if somebody's jumping around and just like being very silly about things. Um, you can also see that there's not much going on. The, um, this bottom line would be the um, violini section. Um, there's not really much going on there, even though there is stuff going on in the basso continuum. 
And I think that's probably just to keep it a little bit lighter so there's not too much lower stuff. Um, but in general, we can do a little glisten. So overall, like this one's actually, like I found it sort of interesting though because even though there, was, there wasn't much going on as far as like there was a Boston continual line but like the other low instrument wasn't really playing, um, there was still like a Basso continual solo line in there before it went back to the like opening section. So that was really interesting just to hear because like you don't, we don't tend to hear a lot of stuff along those lines. Cool. All right, thank you. Hi. Hello. I'm going to be talking about Basso Continuo in the Baroque era, which is something that Telemann used in almost every piece. So Basso Continuo, it played a major role, as I said, um, in the Baroque era in general. But um, what this requires is a keyboardist who has a knowledge of um, counterpoint and um, chords <laughs> as well as um, embellishments, ornamentation, um, and they have to be able to collaborate well with other musicians so that they don't step on someone's toes and they can also, they also have to be able to improvise. Um, as Basso Continuo, as you will see, is um, it's not really written out other than the bass line the rest of it has to be made up on the spot, basically. So um, it's important, as I said here, that the Basso Continuo players are skilled in those areas because otherwise, if, if you bottom out, um, the, the music is gonna sound really bad. <laughs> so the, some, some common Basso Continuo tricks that, that make it sound um, characteristic of the Baroque era include the trill, the mordant, the broken chord, and the turn. And those can also fill space that is um, left uh, when you use the harpsichord or clavichord and it, it, it's, um, it's detaché, it's, it's not very legato. So um, here's an example from the piece that we arranged. Um, so this is from Telemann's Trio in G minor. And this here is just a picture of one measure of basso continuo and you can see it's just a single line um, in the bass but it has uh, uh, numbers above it which indicate which inversion the chord um, which inversion is implied so you can see here if you have an F and it says 6-4 and that means you have a B flat 6-4 chord with the F in the bass and so you follow that um, that pattern with all of them. Um, and after the player figures out which chord to play, they can decide which embellishments to use and how they want to um, arrange it so that it, it fits the instrumentation and, and it's not too overpowering but still interesting. So, finally, with the arrangement that we did, um, some things to take note of include repetitive motifs, um, echoing and emulating one another between the violin, the oboe, um, and the basso continuo. Um, pleasing counterpoint <laughs> with common parallel sixths and thirds. And then um, the basso continuo's contribution to the entire piece. I think it, it just adds a, a low presence. Um, it kind of makes the oboe sound like it, it has a good foundation. So. Um, yeah, so I hope you enjoy the music. Thank you. Four, five, six, seven.